Hi there, I'm Robert Conrad, and this is Living the Classical Life. Robert Conrad, it's such a delight to welcome you to the show here in your studios here at WCLV at the Idea Stream Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Well, thank you for asking me. Well, it's amazing because I grew up and spent most of my adult life listening to your radio broadcasts. So even before I met you, I felt as though I had known you as almost as closely as one of my family members because I would hear your broadcasts in the evenings. Is this a reaction that you get from your community? I am surprised how many people grew up with me. <laughs> they say, well, I was listening back to you when I was in high school. Of course, that makes me feel much older. <laughs> Speaking directly to people in their homes, that's a pretty big audience, and you can't necessarily understand how many people are listening at any given time, well, or can we, you? We have ratings, and, and we have an idea how many people are, are listening in what's called a quarter hour. We also know how many people listen at least once throughout the course of a week. That's called the QM. And somewhere around 75,000 people listen to WCLV at least once during the week. That's incredible. Do you actually try to cater your material and your tone and style to who you think might be listening? Well. We know who is listening, the type of people who are listening. They're over the age of 45 for the most part. They're probably business people, or they're teachers, or they're lawyers, or professional people. And, um, you know, there's an interesting statistics that orchestras find that they get new people coming in after they listen to classical music on the radio. Is that right? Yeah. So. Uh, we've got a 75,000 uh, group of people out there that we can sell the Cleveland Orchestra to and City Music and the rest of the orchestras in town. So if these orchestras are trying to make a conscious push to reach out to younger audiences, is there a similar push with radio or is there a risk in alienating your base by trying to do so? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, on WCLV, we do a number of programs that are involving young people. Uh, for instance, we do the Koyo concerts, and we have a program called Classics for Kids on Saturday morning. I don't know how many kids listen to that. I have no, no idea. Um, and we, in, I, I think we hit the teenagers better than we do the six-year-olds. <laughs> do you think they so, listen? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, some teenagers do, and obviously college students do. Although I have found out something. I, I teach a class at uh, CIM, and these are mostly graduate students. And I ask them to bring some of their CDs in. They say, oh, we don't have CDs anymore. It's all on the smartphone. So they're listening to music, and they can listen to radio on their smartphone. So. Is it easy for a radio commentator to identify that he or she has a radio broadcast personality. Did it always come naturally to you from the time you were a teenager? Well, I wanted to be an announcer, and I wrote scripts to read into that microphone that I made out of toilet paper rolls. Um, and I took voice lessons outside of high school when I was, when I was a teenager. And uh, the teacher's name was Burl Danforth in Kankakee. And I think she was the one who really got me to develop my voice. Now, I listened to recordings of material that I did back in the beginning of WCLV. And I don't think I was very good at that time. Did your tone of voice change yes. over the years? Oh, oh absolutely. Um, it used to be that radio addressed a multitude of people out there. And over the years, that has changed to where you are talking to one person at a time. More intimate. Oh, yes, very, very much so. You're not bang, 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 bang. You're, let's talk together here. 
instead of you are listening to a radio broadcast, you know, yeah, something yeah, extremely yeah, declamatory. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Your broadcasts with the Cleveland Orchestra have sort of given you the name or the, the recognition as the voice of the Cleveland Orchestra. What does that feel like? Oh, I'm very proud to wear that. <laughs> I really am. Um, that's what the orchestra says, so, so it's not my opinion. <laughs> Do you feel like this is a responsibility to, in fact, represent not only the orchestra, but the community's relationship to it? Oh, absolutely. This is a sense of the occasion that you want to achieve of what's going on in the orchestra. Now there are some orchestra broadcasts uh, that sort of take the concert apart and put in some interviews and so forth. And what I want to do is achieve for the radio audience the fact that they're part of the presence of what's happening in Severance Hall right now. How connected do you feel to your listeners? Do you sometimes hear from, has anyone written to you saying that your broadcast has changed their lives? I don't know whether anybody's done that exactly, but I have had requests to play selections on the air for somebody who was in a hospital, which we have done. Um, I have had requests for somebody who died recently, and would we play this piece because he loved it so much, and we would do that. What does that feel like? A great responsibility, and again, that's because we're talking to one person. Yeah, there are a lot of other people who are listening, but the fact that we got a request because the widow of this gentleman who died, she is feeling the fact that we care about her. We're also dealing with people who love music, relating to it on a passionate level. Do you also get letters from people who are very, very adverse to something that they've heard? Yes, we got a, a, a long letter from an individual who said, you play all of this contemporary music. On Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, there was this awful piece on the air. And it turned out to be W.C. <laughs> <laughs> Did they realize that there was a whole century of music that came after that? I, I think, I don't remember whether I wrote a letter back, but somebody in the station wrote a letter and explained, well, W.C. is not considered, you know, uh, ordinary contemporary music, it's, it, it's, it's important music. Well, anyway. If we're talking about classical music and its survival in America, does classical music on the radio have a part to play in this responsibility? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, as I said earlier. Uh, people come to the Cleveland Orchestra because they hear the Cleveland Orchestra on the radio or they get to know classical music on, on the radio. Um, I think it's a miracle that WCLV, which is a multi-million dollar radio station, devotes 24 hours a day to classical music because there are cities of equal size and bigger size that don't have classical music on the radio. Milwaukee doesn't, Orlando doesn't, Miami doesn't, uh, Houston doesn't. So if you've been doing this for over five decades, yeah. I'm sure that you've accumulated your <laughs> more than, <laughs> if I had to think of all the mistakes I make on my show and the outtakes, I'm sure you have some good bloopers. The Me Minor Bass by the Cleveland Orchestra I announced once. <laughs> <laughs> what were you trying to say? The B Minor Bass. <laughs> <laughs> What's your approach to bloopers? Oh, if it is not bad, you don't call attention to it. You just go on. And, but if it is misinformation, then you have to correct yourself. Um, I once got hiccups in the middle of a newscast. <laughs> it was a 15 minute newscast also. That was on WKAN, that was a long time ago. And what really set me off was that there was another announcer standing outside the door and I could hear him laughing. And that just broke me up completely because since somebody else starts laughing when you're laughing, you know, it, it, they feed on each other. Now I know it happens to all of us, myself included. What happens on a live broadcast if a word slips out that you are not supposed to say? I, well, you ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get letters? No, no, no. no. Um, I can't tell you the worst thing that I've done on the radio. <laughs> and it was pretty bad, I must say, but nothing happened to it. Uh, nobody complained, 
it, it involved a piano, a pianist. This was in Honolulu, uh, who was playing, and I, I, I made a comment about uh, about her, and everybody was laughing about it. And somebody somebody called up and says, "Why are you laughing at that poor girl? She's a good pianist." And that was. I have the impression that radio announcers of a certain generation were all men. At what point did this change? Oh, that change? was very true. We were the first radio station in Cleveland to hire a female announcer. Not somebody to do the women's program, mm -hmm. but to be an actual staff announcer. Patty Richards was her name. She became a fairly well-known opera singer in England, as a matter of fact. Was there resistance to that initially? Not from our audience mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. But, you know, we've had uh, female announcers on throughout the entire history of, of, of the radio station. And, and obviously, on other radio stations in Cleveland, there are female disc jockeys and newscasters. And, and on television, there are female reporters and newscasters. So the industry has really shifted over this entire length of time. So a lot of your... Your announcers here are close friends of mine, Dennis mm -hmm. Lewin, Eric Kish, Angela Mitchell, and um, Jackie Gerber. Jackie Gerber, of course, yeah. yes. How could I forget her, the queen of the morn. These are all huge personalities. How do you choose your announcers? Well, the first thing is we ask them if they can pronounce classical music and what they know about classical music. And as a matter of fact, we have an aud audition which was written by Mike Nichols the Mike Nichols at WFMT in Chicago. I was Mike Nichols' replacement on WFMT huh. before he started out on uh, being with Elaine May and doing their comedy duo, and then, of course, he became a movie director and actor and so forth. But um, it's, it's very good because it goes from German to Italian uh, to Chinese <laughs> and so, so forth. And, and that is what will determine whether or not somebody is going to be useful to us. Now, an interesting thing is we have not auditioned anybody since Jackie Gerber. And she has been here, what now, 12 years. Mm -hmm. We have two announcers on duty here at WCLV who have been with us 40 years. We have a very loyal employee base who is very interested in what we're doing. So what exactly was that audition? It, uh, I, I can't repeat it to you. It starts out the, let's see, uh, so announcer's lot in a, is not a happy one because they have so far. Oh, it's so a whole monologue. Yeah. Okay. And you just have them read this in front of you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and, and it takes the, the men from the boys uh, or the girls from the ladies. <laughs> so I think where your job gets very interesting is the fact that you are broadcasting for the Cleveland Orchestra and you probably have insights into the soloists who come through town that most people wouldn't imagine? Well, we interview most of the uh, soloists. I don't do the interviews anymore. I have done them. But usually Angela or John Simna will, will interview who the soloist is going to be. And when I go there on Saturday night and we're going to do a live broadcast, that's really my first introduction to the soloist. Now, I have read biographical pieces about the soloist, and I have my notes about what I'm going to say about the soloist. This is their Cleveland Orchestra debut, or they made their debut in 1972, or, or whatever. But that's the first chance I get to listen to them when they're performing by the, with the Cleveland Orchestra for the audience on Saturday night. Did you know George Sell? Yes. I knew George Sell very well, very well, because he was the one who was interested in getting the broadcast started. It was his idea. He felt the Cleveland Orchestra had to be on the radio. And so, uh, uh, yes, uh, George and I got along very well. My generation would unfortunately not have remembered knowing him. What, what were your impressions of him as a man? Well, he was very stern, obviously. He liked dirty jokes. Really? Yes, yeah. Um, my favorite story about George Sell was uh, Robert Shaw was in a rehearsal of Messiah with the orchestra and the chorus in the, in the hall. And he came in and sat down over one of the air conditioning vents that are underneath the seats at Severance Hall. And Michael Cherry was on the other side, who was the assistant conductor at that time, was on the other side of the hall. And he said, Michael, come here. And he ran over and said, yes, Mr. Zell, what can I do for you? 
Tell them to shut off the air conditioning. It's too cold in here. But sir, it's very warm up on the stage. The, the, the orchestra is in shirt sleeves and we've got the chorus. Wouldn't you be more comfortable if you got up and moved over here away from the blower? Well, he wasn't used to losing a discussion, but he moved <laughs> over. Then he noticed that our engineer of the time, Vlad Malikar, was up in the flies moving a microphone. He said, Michael, come here. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? He said, what is Mr. Malikar doing with that microphone? Well, sir, he's moving the soloist microphone from the left side of the stage to the right side of the stage. Why was this not done before the rehearsal? Because Mr. Shaw has just moved the soloist from the left side of the stage to the right side of the stage, round two. Now, up at the very top of Severance Hall, of course, we have all these microphones hanging over the orchestra, but up at the top is one that you can hardly see. It's connected to the library, so the librarian knows when to bring scores down during the rehearsal, rehearsals. Really? And he looks up there and he sees this microphone and says, Michael, come here. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? He said, you see that microphone? Yes, sir. That is the one that is giving us the trouble with the brasses. Damn it, Mr. Zell, that's not even our microphone. Then he realized who he was shouting at, and he said, but sir, if it were, that's the one we'd be having trouble with. <laughs> was he equally as severe with his soloists? I mean, how did he treat someone as sensitive as Glenn Gould? Well, I can't tell you that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can clean it up. <laughs> Glenn Gould was going through the ritual of adjusting the piano stool. And Sal was standing there waiting for him. And finally he said, Mr. Gould, if you will cut two inches off your derriere, we can get on with the rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess most people wouldn't have, have known about his sense of humor. What was Lauren Mazel like? Well, Lauren Mazel was interesting because he wanted a slightly different sound than what George Sell. George Sell was losing his hearing, and he kept saying, bring the microphones down closer to the strings. And Lauren wanted a big blossom of sound coming out of the orchestra, so we had to make some changes that way. But he was very approachable, and um, I remember that uh, I was uh, out. He was, well, I, I remember what it was. He was out uh, putting his feet in cement for a record store. And I said, aren't, aren't you concerned you're going to get a lot of cement? He says, no, no, this is very important public relations. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he would come in from Japan on, on Wednesday and have a rehearsal on Thursday with the orchestra and then a concert Thursday night and so forth. He, he really drove himself very, very strongly. So your broadcast room in Severance Hall is somewhere backstage. Where it's right, right behind the left proscenium. As you go out the door uh, on, on the left side of the stage, you run into the door to the control room. And the, I'm, I'm sorry, to the announcement. The control room is two flights down. Mm -hmm. So where's your control room at Blossom Center during it's the summer concerts? three flights down. <laughs> three flights down. <laughs> three flights down. And of course, in both cases, we look on the stage with uh, television monitors. Uh, the first year in 1968, which is now the 50th anniversary, we're going to the 50th anniversary of Blossom, uh, we had television monitors to see what was on the stage, and Aaron Copeland and Benny Goodman were coming to do the Copeland Clarinet Concerto, and the television monitors were not working. So we were taking our cues, audio cues, from what we were hearing on the stage, and I was reading the notes about the Clarinet Concerto, and I heard the audience start to applaud, and then they laughed. And I, and I sort of hemmed and hawed and, and said, and went on with my notes. And then I heard the audience start to applaud again, and they laughed again. I had no idea what was going on on stage. And finally, they, Goodman and Copeland came on to do the concerto. So I ran upstairs, three flight stairs up. And I said, what happened? He said, well, Goodman was waiting to go on, and he said, I would like to have a glass of water out there. So the orchestra had tuned, and the door was opening. The audience assumed that he was going to walk out on the stage. Instead, the stage manager went out and put a glass of water down on the floor. <laughs> that was the first lap. He came back. Goodman said, no, no, not there, over there. <laughs> Again, the door opened. 
they assumed that the soloist and the conductor were coming on. They started to applaud, and the stage manager walks out and moves the glass of water. So after the concerto was over and the audience was applauding and I was explaining what had happened about the glass of water to the radio audience, I heard the audience just come out with a huge laugh about what was going on. And so what I found out was that, uh, that um, Goodman had not touched the water at all, and the stage manager had gone out to pick up the water, and the concert master said, I dare you to drink it, and he did. <laughs> Cut the house down. <laughs> and I, I, I actually reviewed that script the other day, and I see where I wrote out all this about the glass of water in the, in the, in the margin of the script. So, so I told the audience about it. So that's one thing that I think most of your listeners don't realize. There's a script. Oh yes, always scripted, yeah. always scripted. I I, uh, I take I get the notes ahead of time uh, from the program book, and then I, uh, I I make them into what I want to say about it. And uh, I only need about a minute or so while the orchestra is tuning to talk about the work. I won't mention his name, but a dear friend of mine was a former announcer of yours, and as he was working the night shift. He once accidentally got locked out of the studio at night. Did this ever happen to you? Yes. <laughs> we, had, uh, uh, we, we had a Chicago Symphony broadcast on, as a matter of fact, and I remembered that I had brought something and left it in the car. We had a garage out at Radio Ranch, and I went out to get it, and the door locked behind me. I could open the garage doors, and so I found a big metal rod, went around to the front. Fortunately, the the outside door was open, but the inside door was locked. And we had a sort of like theater uh, ticket window there uh, to the side in that, in that little alcove. And I took this and banged that uh, and broke the window open. My partner, Pat Patrick, was very unhappy about that. But I got back into the control room in time for, uh, to conclude the broadcast by the Chicago Symphony and do WCLB Saturday night. And did you play it off cool as though nothing had ever happened? Well, I didn't tell the radio audience about it, but I told, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> Pat about it. <laughs> and I said, here, I'll pay for it, I'll pay for it. But it was unbreakable glass, and I really had to go boom, 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 in order to make a hole big enough for me to claw through. Most people know you for your radio personality. What do you like to do when you're off of the radio? I have a model railroad, the WC and LV, Western Cuyahoga and Lorraine Valley. It's, it's an N gauge, which is the track is about like that. And uh, the main train, passenger train, is the James A. Garfield. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, then I have uh, the, uh, well, actually, the railroad goes uh, in my universe from Beechwood to Lorraine and with a uh, uh, branch that goes down to, uh, to, uh, towards Blossom. In all the years that you've been doing this here in Cleveland, what have you learned about the people of the city of Cleveland? First of all, this is a great city, and it is a wonderful musical city. There's so much going on here that in larger cities just isn't happening. You know, we've got city music, we've got Apollo's Fire, we obviously have the Cleveland Orchestra, we have all the concerts that go on at CIM and at BW and at Oberlin and at uh, Kent State. Uh, and it's just almost too much to absorb, <laughs> as, as a matter of fact. And everybody, even if they don't go to the Cleveland Orchestra, they're proud of it. And they brag about it like they might brag about the Browns if they were playing better. <laughs> Are you confident about classical music's survival on the radio? In oh, absolutely. It's not that the formats or the programming is going to change, it's how you're going to receive it that are going to change. Mm -hmm. For instance, when I go down to uh, my condo in Bonita Springs before I go over to Miami for the orchestra broadcast that we, that we feed back to Cleveland when the orchestra plays in Miami, I take my smartphone and plug it into the car radio and listen to WCLV when I tool all over. I have listened to WCLV in Jakarta, Indonesia, in Bali, and the San Francisco Zoo. I've listened in Santiago, Chile. Well, 
Yeah, that's, that's how the future is going to be. Now, when we were a commercial station and we found out that there were listeners in Rio de Janeiro and in Seattle and what have you, that was interesting, but they weren't interested in Key Bank or Heinen's. But now that we're a public radio station, we can ask them to help support us. And we do get uh, donations from people around the world. There is a gentleman in Tokyo, Japan, he's a math professor, who sends $30 to WCLV every month. And he wrote me a, an email and said that he was getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning on Monday to listen to the Sunday afternoon 4 o'clock concert by the Cleveland Orchestra. And I said, no, no, you don't have to do that. That goes into on demand for two weeks. And you can listen Monday morning on the, on the internet to, uh, uh, to the Cleveland Orchestra. You don't have to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning anymore. And Bob, lastly, what's the best thing about your job? Everything I do, this is the career that I have been able to do since I was 14 years old. And a lot of people can't say that. I, luck, I like to come to work. I'm not tired of coming to work. And as I say, they're going to carry me feet first out of the studio with the microphone in my cold, dead hand. Robert Conrad, thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure to get some insights into your life, and I wish you many more years of the amazing work that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much.